Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Water Wednesday. And this month's Water Wednesday will focus on urban agriculture. To kick off the Urban Agriculture Month, I invited a specialist, a food system specialist, Dr. Catherine Campbell, joining us today. So if you wonder what urban agriculture is, don't miss this uh, live talk. You will learn some basic concepts of urban agriculture and we look forward to discussing with you for any questions that you may have. Now let's welcome Dr. Campbell. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Campbell. I'm assistant professor and state extension specialist in community food systems. And I am going to be talking with you about urban agriculture. Um, so before we get started here, um, I'd like you all to think about whether you are participating in urban agriculture. Um, so if you have any thoughts, go ahead and put them in the chat. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what urban agriculture is, and then I'm going to talk about the key types of benefits uh, that the research literature has found that it has for communities. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the limitations of urban agriculture. So to begin, uh, the answer to the question of what is urban agriculture is not straightforward. Uh, there is no standard definition in the literature. The definitions that people use depend on the region, the country they're in, the field of study, or the purpose for which they're engaging in or thinking about urban agriculture. So I think it's helpful uh, when you're trying to think about what urban agriculture is, is to think about what the purposes it's being used for. So urban agriculture can be uh, commercial agricultural production. So that would be things like urban farms, market gardens, and farmers markets. Uh, it can also be non-commercial or non-profit activities. So those could be um, home gardens or school or community gardens. Um, and then there are also sort of hybrid operations that have both a commercial element and also a non-commercial element. So sometimes, for example, a non-profit will have a market garden where they grow food uh, and then sell it in order to support their non-profit activities. So here are some examples just to help you have an image of what urban agriculture can be. So this is an image from Calera, which is a commercial agricultural uh, operation in the Orlando area. And you can see here it's indoor, it's incredibly high tech. Um, they use no pesticides, it's no GMO. They promote themselves as being sustainable and local. Here's another example of commercial urban agriculture occurring in the Orlando area. Uh, and you can see here, this is outdoors. It's being done in soil in an urban space. It's a very small market garden uh, and they sell to local community members via community supported agriculture or farmers markets. And here's a third example where uh, it's an urban agriculture operation that is a nonprofit, and what they are doing is not uh, commercial, but intending to support communities. So improve blighted conditions, revitalize neighborhoods, providing uh, therapeutic activities and um, increasing access to healthy food in communities. So urban agriculture is many activities, uh, as I've just been talking about. So we have all different kinds of gardens from home, community, and institutions. Uh, they're urban and peri-urban farms, farming on vacant lots, keeping animals, bees, poultry. Uh, there are vertical and horizontal greenhouse production, aquaculture, uh, and then also urban sales are generally included in urban agriculture. So that would be food that's produced outside of the urban area, but then sold within the urban space. So you can see here, it's uh, an infographic that I had put together to sort of give you a better picture and how all of these pieces I've been talking about put together. So on the far right, you can see the very urban core or downtown urban areas. You tend to see things like rooftop farming, 
um, or some urban farms on lots. And as you move to the left, uh, you start to see things like edible landscaping, community gardens, um, and then some suburban and peri-urban activities which are happening in people's homes and backyards. Um, so this is a nice way to see that urban agriculture spans from on the perimeter of urban areas, so peri-urban, all the way down to urban cores of communities. So turning now to some of the benefits that urban agriculture can have for communities, there are social and cultural benefits. Um, so these can have to do with increasing uh, social connections or community cohesion, creating improvements in pride of place, providing spaces, particularly at community gardens for community members to interact. Um, people can support cultural expression by being able to grow foods that they grew in their uh, homeland if they are new to the United States. Um, and for families that garden together, uh, you can have strengthening intergenerational relationships, for example, with grandparents um, gardening with their grandchildren. There are some opportunities for community development, um, and this is particularly true for these commercial operations. So if they're doing entrepreneurial urban agriculture, um, that could increase capital or business opportunities, or it can create jobs in communities. This can potentially increase property values um, and uh, promote youth development and job training opportunities within communities. Another benefit, unsurprisingly, given that urban agriculture is focused on food production, is that it can increase access to food or food security within communities. So it can help people, uh, if they're growing their own food, save money on groceries or have access to food that they might not be able to afford. Uh, it can help meet communities' fresh produce needs. Um, it can increase access and consumption of fresh, organic, culturally appropriate produce. And then finally, it can support food system resilience. And, and what I mean by resilience is just that um, in a time of crisis, whether that's a public health crisis or a, a weather emergency like we have sometimes in Florida uh, with hurricanes, um, having food that's produced directly in communities can provide that access to food that maybe when there are supply chain disruptions, um, you wouldn't otherwise have access if you're relying on food from the other side of the country. There are also health and well-being benefits. Um, so gardening can be a source of mental activity or mental health um, benefits from stress reduction, um, being connected to nature. Um, and there are also some environmental benefits that can have health benefits from filtering air um, or temperature moderation in urban environments. And the last group of benefits um, are environmental. And I, I believe um, a future Water Wednesday is gonna talk about these in more depth, but urban agriculture can have benefits from potentially reducing greenhouse gas emissions from food transportation. Um, the production systems can potentially uh, reduce energy or resource inputs that are required. There, it can increase biodiversity. It can reduce air pollution. And again, it can regulate temperature in urban areas. So for all these benefits I've been talking about, there are some limitations. Um, the most important one is often referred to as the helicopter model, which is where someone comes from outside an area and drops in and initiates some sort of an urban agriculture operation, whether that is a nonprofit or a community garden, um, but they're doing so from the outside of the community. And then once they leave the community, the operation um, won't continue on on its own. So uh, in terms of the second bullet point, that's one issue for sustainability is that the people starting the programs aren't in, involved for the long term. Um, there are also some issues with um, financial sustainability for some of these operations if they uh, require a lot of capital to get themselves operating or continue. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there, there is the possibility that they will increase property values, but by increasing property values, there is a possibility that some of these operations will displace or marginalize low-income residents. 
And then finally, uh, when we are in an urbanizing environment, um, there are some issues with long-term land tenure or competition with land development or other land uses. Um, so, you know, if someone is just um, farming on a vacant lot and the landowner decides to develop that lot, then they would lose access to that land to do their urban farming. And now I'm happy to turn it over for some questions. Thank you, Catherine. I didn't realize uh, I muted myself. And also I got so excited to just uh, jump into the Water, Water Wednesday Ask Extension about the urban agriculture. I didn't even introduce myself. So <laughs> if you just watch our Water Wednesday, my name is Yi Ling Zhuo. I'm the Water Resources Regional Specialized Agent in UFIFS Extension Central District. And I'm based in Mid Florida Research and Education Center in Apopka. So it's uh, in the greater Orlando area. We've been doing this Water Wednesday series uh, since May 2020. So we've covered the different topics uh, and uh, the reason we did uh, uh, Urban Ag last December and uh, this year we decided to do that again because we got uh, quite a bit of interest. People want to know what urban agriculture is. Uh, just like Catherine mentioned, it can be any kind of forms. Uh, it's very broad because if you search the question I got earlier, was uh, if you search USDA's definition of urban ag. So it feels like everything under the sun, like related to your food can be categorized uh, as urban ag. Then the question people ask, it's uh, how can they do it? Because uh, they, they have so many limitations, uh, either the city ordinance, uh, don't let them do that. Uh, oh, it's uh, in their HOA. So the HOAs uh, don't let them to grow their own food or have their backyard chicken. So I know this is not really like your, uh, like your research uh, focus, uh, but do you have any insights of what might be the good start point for these folks uh, to start Urban Ag? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so, one thing that is important to know is that Florida is a home rule state, which means that local governments are able to make their own policies, which means, you know, we can't say for the entire state of Florida that you can do X, but not Y. Um, so it's a sort of thing where for each, you know, municipality or county, um, so some people in uh, the city of Orlando might be subject to city policies, but then they're also in Orange County. And so there can be sort of overlapping regulations. Um, and so one important thing to do in potentially your local extension office could help um, guide you as to which sorts of regulations you might be subject to. And then once you know that, you can go to something called Unicode. Um, so that's M-U-N-I, which is the beginning of municipal, uni, muni code. Um, and if you search muni code, you can find your local municipality and you can just uh, put in a search term and say, you know, backyard chickens or um, urban agriculture, urban farm. And that will help you see the exact regulations that are apply to your area. And um, in some cases, if there are, if there, you get zero search results, then that means that there is no ordinance. Um, and so what's important to understand about that um, is it, it means that it's, I don't wanna say it's not allowed or disallowed, but it's a sort of thing that your local government hasn't thought about yet. And that's a good opportunity for you to go to them and say, you know, here's an ordinance that we think we'd like. We would like to have backyard chickens. And that can be a start of a conversation uh, with your local municipality or your county to get some uh, local food policies on the books and your codes of ordinances. That's great because I'm typing. I just find the, the Unicode and I put it into the chat box. Yeah, that's a great tool because I, 
I like your, I just, I just like your suggestion. It's because uh, it's, it's, it can be very complicated. It depends on numerous uh, factors. So, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that there's a real opportunity for education, you know, both from extension and also on the part of community residents. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if you, you have an HOA and they disallow things, that maybe your your municipality does allow. Um, there's an opportunity for you to educate that there are ways to do these activities that will not um, have bad smells, or you know, there are ways to do these activities so that you won't be uh, disrupting your neighbors um, in doing them. You know, and and that's something that um, you know we we as Florida residents can advocate. You know, with our HOAs. To get these sorts of um, activities to be allowed. Great. Uh, then I have another question. It's uh, in your lightning talk, you mentioned urban agriculture has uh, environmental benefits. Uh, that's uh, I've been hearing some like the opposite opinions uh, in that perspective. Uh, uh, especially like we know for small farms, some small farms uh, they, uh, or hobby farms, uh, they tend to use uh, more fertilizers uh, than big operation. So when it comes to urban, oh, another example, it's uh, residential lawns uh, tend to use more water and more fertilizers. So for urban agriculture, it has the environmental benefits but when it comes to fertilizer for water use, uh, it seemed to be the opposite. Then what do you think? Yeah, I think that's, it's it's interesting. And I, I, pre I presented my benefits. Um, there are also, I have a whole other set of slides on limitations and, and these are the kinds of things. So, you know, when you're doing really small scale production, whether it's commercial or just something at home, you're not going to achieve some of those efficiency of scale. Um, and, you know, for, for those of us where I'm a social scientist, right, I, I'm, I'm not trained in doing the very best, you know, fertilization practices where a lot of the commercial producers may know exactly how to implement uh, fertilizers to, you know, use only as much as they need to and minimize impacts to water. Um, where some of, as you mentioned, hobby farmers may not know how to do that. Um, and so they may end up accidentally over applying or applying at the wrong times. And so um, there is this balance where, you know, we, and that's, that's part of why I was careful to say there's a reduction in energy use from food transportation. So that's definitely true if it's coming locally, but it may not be that the way it was produced is actually more energy efficient. And so there's this sort of balance between the economy of scale potentially and how far the food is traveling. And I think often when people are talking about um, some of the benefits in terms of water, for example, they're thinking of really high tech urban ag operations that are potentially soilless systems that are recycling water. And so, you know, they're not the same as a hobby farmer doing dirt farming, you know, that sort of thing. And so um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because there is this thought that urban agriculture is more environmentally beneficial, period. And it's like, it's more like some of it is potentially in certain ways and some of it isn't in other ways. And so it's really important, again, as there is no universal definition there is no universal yeah. answer to, you know, it's community benefits, it's environmental benefits, it's, you know, health and wellness benefits. And so it, it all just kind of depends on the, the particular operation and what they're trying to do and how they're doing it. Yeah, that's true. It's, uh, I think, without a universal definition and the operation guide or manual, that does add challenges uh, for just for quantification, uh, like quanti quantify the benefits. And I think it's, uh, I think it, it's kind of related back to the discussion we had before we start this webinar, it's uh, system thinking. So it's just how you see it, uh, just 
Like if you just see it, it's just the production side. Yeah, it may use more water because it's a small scale and it may use more resources. But if you expand the boundary, you look at the whole life cycle, especially the delivery of packaging process. So that can be more environment or resource friendly. And, and that also just pop up on my head. Uh, you mentioned it's uh, those uh, soilless uh, production, they recycle water, because that was the question I had when I went to visit uh, uh, um, control environment greenhouse production. Um, yeah, they, they, the, the water system is a closed loop, so mm -hmm. they don't use actual water, however, they use uh, tons of energy, so, so right. that made me right. think it, uh, <laughs> right, so it's because like, yeah. you, you, you need a you need to treat that water and the treating that water requires energy and to control the environment. We know also you need energy to control the temperature, to control the humidity. So water wise, it's very water efficient, but right. energy wise, it's another story. So that moment I was just thinking, wow. So I put it outside if it's an open field, then from the resource perspective, it doesn't use that much energy. However, uh, when it comes to the yield, so how much you can control, how much factor. So I think what I want to say here, it's uh, it, it sounds really simple. It's uh, probably you just have one acre yard doing your like backyard urban ag, or you have five acres, or you have like 20 acres of doing greenhouse production. So many factors that play into uh, urban ag. It can be so simple, but meanwhile, it can be so complicated. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, in some cases, um, these operations are located in a, a food desert area or an area where there's limited access to healthy food, um, but um, they're not actually growing the food for that community, right? So they may be doing really um, high tech production that is intended to be sold to high end restaurants. Um, you know, where the, the hypothetical person you mentioned with the one acre in the backyard, you know, they may not be producing as much, but they are producing for their immediate neighbors. And so it's, it's all of these, a lot of it just depends on um, the type of operation and why they're doing what they're doing and for whom. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I'm checking our Facebook page and see if we have any questions. I don't see any questions here. So I'm pretty sure when people see the recording, they may have more questions. So, so if you are watching the live talk now, uh, please put your questions into the chat box. Uh, we'll address your questions uh, during the live talk. So if you are watching the recordings, uh, don't hesitate at also to put your questions into the chat box. Uh, we'll still comment and get answers back to you. So before I let Catherine go, I do have another question. So, uh, because um, because it's a uh, I know you mentioned that because it's hard to quantify what urban ag is, uh, but still that's a that's a question actually I was asked quite often. It's uh, any idea like how popular urban agriculture is, or if you can give a number on that. Well, so it's really hard because um, the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA does a census of agriculture um, where they, they reach out and quantify the number of farms, where they are, what they're growing, you know, all of the details, the age of farmers, um, uh, you know, minority or female owned farmers, all of these things. Um, but they say explicitly that they realize that the census of agriculture doesn't capture urban agriculture, right? And so, so if they did, that would give us that apples to apples comparison of, you know, what rural versus urban ag. Um, and so I've been doing research study for about the last 18 months on looking at urban agriculture in Florida and trying to get sort of an initial picture of, you know, who are urban farmers? Where are they? What are they doing? Um, and, you know, sort of all of the things I was mentioning, like these are all examples that we're finding. 
Um, but in terms of, you know, we were really just focused on the commercial production, not, not the nonprofit, not the home gardeners. Um, but what we're finding is they really are located in all of the, um, all the urban sort of centers around the state. So in the Southeast and the Tampa area and Jacksonville and Orlando. Um, and they're operating on really, really small scale. Um, so many of them less than an acre, some of them less than half an acre. So very, very small. Um, and, and many of them are just, um, you know, an individual or a, a couple um, that have decided to become farmers. Um, more than half of them have only been doing this for five years or less. Um, and so it's a sort of thing that people are really um, getting excited about to um, learn more about agriculture and contribute positively to their food system. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's a growing industry in, in Florida for sure. Great, that's a great news, uh, knowing it's a growing industry in Florida. Uh, yeah. Just just saw one question here. Uh, could you tell us about the using solar energy in the farm? <laughs> I think that's uh, more like a follow-up I just mentioned earlier. <laughs> Yeah, so I I am um, so because I'm a social scientist, I don't I don't actually do production. I do more of understanding the role it plays in communities. Um, but I know that that is something that a lot of uh, urban ag producers are trying to do, um, where they're trying to minimize inputs to the farm um, and do that sort of closed loop system that you were talking about, where also they're using some of their waste to create compost, to create inputs. And so I know that a lot of farms are interested in doing that, but I don't myself know how to do that. Um, I think that would be for one of the, one of my colleagues uh, to answer that question. Yeah, that's also made me think, because it go back to the economy of scale. If you have one acre farm, how like what's the payback rate mm -hmm. and it's also if you have enough roof surface or because it's one acre you probably use the whole acre for your operation not for like solar panels so it's just like if you have enough land surface to install the panels yeah mm -hmm. that can be that, that will be, I, I believe that's also a decision factor. That also remind me the other day I saw a news, I forgot in which state. Uh, they have these uh, solar panels, but under the solar panels, they can also grow crops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think that's, a, to, to me, that's just a really like a win-win situation because I've seen those solar farms. So it's just besides panels, you have nothing. But if you, we can also utilize the land underneath, you can also farm. That can mm -hmm. be really like efficient. But that's a good question. So yeah. once we find out the answer, we will put it here. We will probably do a Water Wednesday just under solar energy in farm. I think that's a very interesting topic. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, if you are still watching, like if you're watching our Water Wednesday, uh, feel free to ask the question. We still have a little bit of time left. So don't miss this opportunity to ask our food system specialist any questions and have the interaction with her. This, that I also, I think that I promise that's my last question. <laughs> I cannot promise actually. Uh, that's the act, um, question we, we, we were asked in probably several Water Wednesday ago uh, about the rooftop production. Because that was the one example you gave in the infographics. So this rooftop um, production, how popular are these rooftop ads in Florida? Oh. I, I think it's growing, absolutely. Um, there are a lot of people realizing that you know, they could, instead of that space just sitting there, it could be utilized for food production. So um, for folks in central Florida, there is a um, aquaponic farm right in uh, Winter Garden, in the downtown Winter Garden. Um, and so I think, you know, these, these are being, um, it's something that people are realizing more and more as an opportunity. 
Um, and in some cases, um, you know, with, and again, I'm a social scientist, not environmental, but, um, you know, the green roofs and having vegetation on a roof can actually help cool um, because it's absorbing some of the heat from the sun. Um, and so some of that kind of thing where people are using, using rooftops productively um, is something that people are looking at more and more. And this, again, is one of these questions of looking at what your local regulations are. And is this something, mm -hmm. you know, many ordinances didn't anticipate rooftop gardening. They didn't think about that. And so, you know, thinking about whether you can do that and where you can do it and how you can do it safely are all really important things to think about. Yeah, that's such a good reminder. Don't forget to check your local ordinance before you yeah. jump in. Yeah, that's that's a good reminder. I almost <laughs> forgot about that. <laughs> always, always check first, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> And thank you so much, Catherine, for this informative talk and also very informative uh, discussion. We always yeah. enjoy having you at our Water Wednesday. Well, and thank also, you for having me. Oh, of course. And thank you for those uh, who watch our Water Wednesday. Uh, just want to let you know, uh, next Water Wednesday, we'll have a webinar on how to grow your own food in urban areas. So if you're interested in this talk, uh, you can find a registration link on our uh, on this uh, Facebook page, uh, UFI Fest Extension Central District Water Resources uh, Facebook page. We look forward to virtually connecting with you uh, in our next Water Wednesday. And with that, thank you again, Catherine. And mm -hmm. thank you again, everyone. Wish you all have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.